This is my son. <laughs> you can tell what kind of meeting we're at by how quickly you laugh, OK? Uh, my son went into the kitchen over Christmas break, and he pulled an oven mitt up onto his arm, and he proceeded to preg check his stuffed cow. <laughs> if that doesn't say we're country people, I don't know what does, all right? And for the economist in the audience, Dr. Rawson, the cow was bred. She got to stay, all right? We know how the real world works at our house. Uh, here are the two of them together. I have a three-year-old and a two-year-old, and we gave them the duty of bottle feed, or I'm sorry, of halter breaking their doggy lamb. They drug her around the yard for a while, and everybody was hot and sweaty and upset, and the next thing I know, my son had loaded her in their pickup. And he looked at me and said, Mama, she'll go anywhere I want now. <laughs> so they're creative, if nothing else. Uh, I, I give that background because I'm going to try to come at this presentation with some um, practical knowledge. And my hope is that some of the experiences that we've had will be more helpful than someone just up here spouting off the law as we talk about these issues. Um, I have to give a disclaimer when I speak. I'm a lawyer. I'm not your lawyer. Uh, if you need one of those, I, I could sure help you find one. That's not me today. Uh, so here's what we're going to cover. The first thing we're going to talk about is why written leases are necessary and important. Then we're going to talk a little bit about setting the lease rate. Um, that's how do we structure these and what should we be paying or charging. Um, we're going to then do what's called my father's favorite section. You'll see why in a moment. And we'll spend just a bit of time looking at some key tips for drafting a grazing lease or a hunting lease. In that section, we'll also do some liability discussion that I think will be really important. Okay? So the first thing, why is a written lease necessary? When I started my job, folks would ask me, well, is there just a like, standard lease form that everybody uses? Can't you just send that to me? The truth is, a lot of ag leases look like that, right? Two guys in a pasture. They've known each other their whole lives. One of them says, I'll lease it to you for X amount. The other one says, OK. They shake hands and go on about their business, OK? That oral lease in the pasture, is that a valid contract under Texas law? One person said no, one person said yes. The lawyer in me rejoices at conflict, all right? So the answer is the way that lawyers answer every question you ever have. It depends, OK? So why is a written lease necessary? Well, one reason is the law says so sometimes. So the general rule is that an oral lease or an oral contract is valid, but there's something called the statute of frauds. And what the statute of fraud says is that a lease or a contract that's going to last, uh, revolve real estate, so a lease of real estate lasting a year or more, that has to be a written document to be legally enforceable. All right? So if you're entering into a two, three, five-year lease, if you don't have that in writing, you do not have a valid contract. Now, why does that matter? Well, if you end up in a dispute, and you have to go to court. The claim you're going to want to make is breach of contract. And guess what the first thing a judge looks for in a breach of contract case is? A contract, right? So particularly if you're going to have leases that last longer than a year, you need those in writing, OK? There are a number of other reasons here. I have kind of decided to just hit the top two today. The second one is that you never know what might happen. I'm going to use this picture to illustrate. The guy on the bay horse in the denim shirt's my dad. He's been in agriculture his whole life. He's been a landlord. He's been a tenant. He gets it, right? He's the kind of guy you have an oral lease with, and you probably don't lose too much sleep at night. The guy on the gray horse is my city boy cousin from Switzerland. He came to America for Thanksgiving and rode his first horse. He wrote home and told everyone that he basically rode sea biscuits. Sarge hasn't run a step since the 80s, all right? But my, co my cousin came, and at Thanksgiving, we preg check cows, OK? That's our holiday tradition. It's where my kid gets it. And my cousin came, and I don't know what he thought preg checking was, but the vet got started. He looked at me and said, if I don't leave now, I will never have children. <laughs> and he went back to the house, OK? Here's the problem. You might be fine if you have an oral lease with my dad. But heaven forbid something happens to my dad, 
and the land gets inherited by my Swiss cousin. And now you're in a situation where the land you need for your operation is controlled by someone who doesn't understand what we do, who doesn't understand why we do it. I promise you in that situation, you're going to want an oral agreement. And unfortunately, that's not just hypothetical. I got a phone call in my office yesterday. A guy called. He had a seven-year lease on a place down in Central Texas where he was running his cows. Two years in, the landowner dies. His son inherits it, and the son lives in New York City. Okay? About two months later, the son decided he didn't like some of the dirt work and brush clearing and fence building the tenant had done to the tune of about $15,000 of the tenant's money and decided he was going to just cancel the lease. And he had talked to his lawyer, and the lawyer told him, well, that guy doesn't really have a leg to stand on because it was a seven-year lease. It wasn't in writing. You can do what you want. And this guy's now in a panic because, number one, he has spent $15,000 prepping that land on the assumption he would be able to use it for seven years. And number two, now he has nowhere to put his cows. Okay? And what he kept saying to me on the phone is, why didn't I know to have an oral, or why didn't I know to have a written lease? I should have known. And it's super easy to armchair quarterback it, right? I'm telling you today, I don't care your situation. You need a written lease agreement. All right? Let's shift gears and talk just for a second about calculating payment. For ag leases, there are sort of three payment arrangements that are the most common. Uh, by far the most common and kind of the easiest to figure and understand is a cash lease. That's just you set a payment and the person pays it, right? So a lot of times that will be done per acre or per head. Sometimes you'll see per animal unit. We'll talk about that in a minute. Okay? Pretty straightforward cash lease. That's what, what most grazing leases are going to be set up as. Another option is a crop share lease. We see that a lot more with row crop operations. So if you're growing cotton or corn or milo or whatever, the, the landowner and the tenant will share in certain expenses and then they share in the income. Okay? The key on a crop share lease, if you're going to get into one of those, is spell out the details in that document. It needs to be written in such a way that not only do the landowner and the tenant understand, but also a jury could understand. Okay? And so when you spell those details out, it needs to be things like what expenses will be shared in. What kind of receipts are going to have to be kept before the other person pays expenses, etc. The third option is sort of a mix of the first two, and it's usually called either a flex or a hybrid lease. And that lease, generally what you'll see is you'll have kind of a floor set. So maybe we'll say, okay, I'm going to lease the land for $10 an acre, but if some external factor happens, it shifts up or down. So for example, you might see a lease that says, we'll lease the, well, 10's a bad example for corn. We'll lease the land for $30 an acre, but if the price of corn gets above $4, it flexes up, and we make an additional payment of so much per acre. You would also have a flex down if prices drop to a certain level. Generally, the external flex is either on yield or price, but you can set that however you want. Again, the important thing there is spell that out, right? The price of corn when, the price of corn where, on what board. That sort of information matters when you're looking at those leases. The one other thing I'll say here on structuring a lease, the way you set that up, I don't think it matters which one you use. There's not one I don't think that's, that's better than the others necessarily. It depends on your circumstance. But it will affect you other places how you structure those. All right? So for example, at the FSA office, any sort of program payments are calculated differently under a flex, I'm sorry, under a share lease or a cash lease, okay? So for example, if you're getting Title I program payments under the Farm Bill, right, ARC or PLC, if you have a cash lease, the money all goes to the tenant. If you've got a share lease, the money gets split like any other income. So that could have a big impact depending on the, the type of operation that you have. Similarly, you can see issues with regard to um, Social Security income and self-employment taxes, depending on how you structure a lease. So my advice to you there would be visit with your accountant before you decide how to set up a lease and before you make any changes to how it is structured, just to make sure you've got any impacts considered when you're making that decision. The next question.
question is, how much should I charge? And again, the lawyer is going to be helpful and tell you it depends. Um, and it does, right? Every lease is different. So it depends on the amount of forage, the quality of forage. Do you have to haul water? It's worth a lot to me not to have to haul water. Um, what are the fences like, et cetera? I'm going to give you some general information um, from the government, some different um, statistics and publications. I always think you're better off to talk to folks on the ground. Talk to other landowners. Talk to other lessees. Talk to your county extension agent or your extension range specialist. They're going to be much better able to help you figure out what's going on on the ground, given your scenario, than the publications are. But the numbers from the government. So the USDA NAS does a survey every year that looks at um, the average lease rates uh, by state, by region, and by county. These are average numbers statewide for Texas. This is not going to be that helpful because Texas is a big state. I'm going to break it down some more in just a second, okay? Um, for pasture land, it's 670 an acre. All of these are per acre per year, okay? 670 an acre, non-irrigated cropland 30 an acre, irrigated cropland 91. Let's get a little bit closer to home. All right, so if you look at the northern high plains region, which is basically the panhandle, number 11 here, pasture land average is 720, irrigated cropland is 3150, I'm sorry, non-irrigated, and irrigated cropland is 139. If you look specifically at Hemphill County, pasture land is 630, 19 for non-irrigated cropland, and 60 for irrigated. If you need this for your own county, you can go pull that up. You'll see those are 2017 numbers. They only do the breakdown every other year, but this is an odd-numbered year, so we'll get it in September, okay? They do it for every county in the United States, but their website's kind of a disaster. <laughs> so what I'm going to offer you today is if you get on there and you can't find it, if you will call me or email me, I will pull it for you. I've got it saved. It's real easy for me to click into and find the numbers. If you need those, let me know, all right? Sure, it's USDA NAS, National Ag Statistics Service, and probably your best bet is to Google that and cash rent survey. Yep, cash rent survey. The other publication, which is great, and the new version is actually coming out tomorrow, so I'm here, uh, good timing, is the Texas Rural Land Trends Report. This comes out every year, and it's a publication that's available for free. It breaks the state into seven regions and then multiple subregions. So if you look, I just pulled this from last year's report. Um, we're looking here at the High Plains. Um, you look, they've got kind of three different areas here. And then they give you a report that looks like this. So for the northern panhandle, they give you the value, so like if you were going to buy or sell property for different categories, but they also give you the rental range. And so you can see ranges there. For range land in the northern panhandle, you're looking at 7 to 12 an acre. Um, and again, that's per acre per year. So that can be really useful for a number of reasons. It covers the entire state of Texas. If you want to look that up, you can just Google Texas Rural Land Trends Report. Or if you subscribe to my blog, as soon as that comes out tomorrow, I'll have a post on that that will come right to your email so you don't have to go digging. And I'll give you the information about the blog here in just a moment. Okay, so that's a little bit on calculating um, payments. Now we're going to do what I call my father's favorite section. My dad has had free legal advice for 10 years. Okay? And I preach and I preach and we still have leases that aren't in writing. There's that verse in the Bible about a prophet can't be a prophet in his hometown. I'm living it. All right? So not too long ago, my dad calls and he says, hey, we're going to lease the place across the road, and I want you to write a lease. Well, miracles have happened. And then he follows up, and he says, but I don't want all your legal crap in there. You get one page. So I wrote a one-page lease. Now, does that have everything I want in it? No. Is it better than the nothing we had before? You bet. All right? So my point here is kind of twofold. Number one, your lease doesn't have to be super complicated. It doesn't have to be a 50-page document that uses legalese you can't understand. In fact, it shouldn't be, all right? The other thing is, it doesn't necessarily have to be an adversarial process. Some of the best leases I've seen is where the landlord and the tenant sit down together 
and write a lease they both can live with. I think that's a great approach to it. We host leasing workshops around the state and we've had a couple times where landowners and tenants have come together and left with a lease. And they were both really happy. I think that's great, all right? So I call this my father's favorite section because this is all the legal crap we don't have in our lease. The first thing you wanna think about in a lease is having a clause that addresses assignments and subleasing, all right? So for example, if I lease my land to Andy to run cows, could Andy then sublease it to someone else? Under Texas law, the answer is no. He would have to have my permission to do that. But unless you've taken the bar exam, you may not know that. And so it's a good idea in your lease to address, can a sublease happen? And what the parameters are if it can. A forum clause can be really useful if you're leasing to somebody who's not from around here, okay? A forum clause will basically say, um, any disputes over this lease will be heard in Hemphill County, Texas, okay? If you're leasing to your neighbor, you don't need that. But on our ranch this year, we leased our hunting rights to a guy from Austin, okay? You better believe we had a forum clause because if we end up in a lawsuit with a guy from Austin, right, two reasons, I want a forum clause. Number one, I don't want to have to go to Austin every time we have a hearing. Number two, if we end up in court and I got to pick a jury, I want a room full of people like this, right? Home court advantage. So that can be really important if you're, if you're um, leasing to someone from farther away, absolutely, um, even from a different county. I mean, it'll shock you. There's some politics that go on in small town Texas counties, right? You might want to be in one county or another. And so that's something important to look at. An attorney fee provision is important as well. The general rule in America is win, lose, or draw, everybody pays their own lawyer. One way to change that is by contract. And your contract can have a clause that says the prevailing party can recover reasonable attorney fees. And that means if you go to court and win, they pay for your lawyer. And that can be important. Okay? Two more clauses, and we're going to talk a bit more about these issues in a minute, but it's a liability clause and an indemnification clause. A liability clause in a lease just says basically that the landowner is not liable for the acts of the tenant and vice versa, okay? We're each liable for our own actions. An indemnification clause goes a step further and says in the event that we get sued because of something the other party did, they will indemnify us. That means they'll make us whole, they'll hold us harmless. Practically, that means they'll pay for our lawyer and they'll cover any judgment against us. Okay, real briefly while we're talking about liability, I'm just going to throw this in there. Every landowner in Texas needs liability insurance. There are no exceptions. Okay, I'll go further for you. Every tenant in Texas, if you're running cattle, if you're raising cotton, you need liability insurance. There are no exceptions. Okay, if something happens on your land, the odds of you being a defendant in a lawsuit are fairly high because guess what? They teach lawyers like me that landowners are all rich, okay? And when somebody gets injured, who do you sue? The rich people. That's exactly right, okay? I don't care where you get your liability insurance. I don't care about the details of, of, of any of that stuff, but you need to have it on your property, okay? Now, the other thing I'll tell you is liability insurance, pretty darn cheap. Here's my story. We lease 150 acres in Carson County where we run some cows, all right? I called our insurance agent. We put our cows over there, and I said, we got to add 150 acres. I want liability coverage, okay? And what's my concern? My concern is we got a hot wire fence, and if one of those cows gets out on the road and gets hit, I'm going to get sued, right? I want insurance for that. And what does insurance do for me? We all know it pays the judgment against us if we get one, but the other thing it does is it provides a defense, right? So if my cow gets hit on the road, first phone call I make is the insurance company, and they hire me a lawyer on their dime, okay? That's important stuff. Anybody know what it costs to have liability insurance, just liability, on 150 acres in Carson County? $65 a year. $65 a year. It's crazy not to do that, okay? 
Now, your, home, your, your you know, farm and ranch policy that covers your house and the barns and those sorts of things, that's going to be more expensive because it's property coverage. But the liability is cheap. Okay, so there's my soapbox on that. Let's talk about grazing leases. I pulled just a couple of topics I thought were important to look at. Um, but one thing I'll mention here in a minute, I have a handbook that's available. It's free. Um, you can find it on my website. It's called the Rancher's Agricultural Leasing Handbook. It's got a checklist in there for what to include in a grazing lease, a hunting lease, and a livestock lease. Um, they're like eight pages long. Clearly, we don't have time to go through all of that today. So I pulled just two or three things for us to talk about. But if you want to copy that book, I'll make sure and tell you how to get one in just a minute. For grazing leases, the number one thing I'm going to say is to set a stocking rate. Now, I'm here telling you this is the number one thing to do in a grazing lease, but I didn't include it in my dad's one pager. Why? Who is my dad in my story? He was the tenant. Is a stocking rate helpful to a tenant? Nope. Right? Stocking rate tells me how many cows I can put out there. So if I'm a landowner, that's the most important clause I'm going to have in a lease. If I'm a tenant, I'd rather you not put that in there. So what I'm telling you is when you're looking at a checklist or looking at a lease, think about what side you're on. Okay? Had that landowner asked us to put it in, we would have. But he didn't. He just signed it. So all the better. Okay? So again, a stocking rate just limits the number of head that can be on the property. One thing to consider for stocking rates is the size of animals. So for example, if I tell you you can run 100 head of mama cows, will that change for me if I'm thinking about 100 head of 1,000 pound Angus cows and you show up with 100 head of 1,500 pound Charlotte cows? All of a sudden, my number may not be great, right? Same thing with stalkers. If you're bringing in 400 pound calves, that's a lot different than 800 pound calves. And so one way to deal with that is to use an animal unit measurement. An animal unit for cattle works like this. A thousand pounds is one animal unit. Okay? Got a thousand pound cow, she's one. Got a fifteen hundred pound cow, she's one point five. And so it automatically takes size into consideration when you're setting that limit. So that's something to think about as well. Um, there are similar numbers. In my handbook, I have a chart for different species. Um, I, for sheep, I know it's six sheep is one animal unit, if that helps anyone. Ten, okay. Um, the next thing is this number may need to change based on drought or wildfire. I'm preaching to the choir in this room, okay? We live both. You understand that, right? What I think is a good stocking rate now was not a good stocking rate in 2012, okay? And so especially if you're going to enter into a multi-year lease, better have some way in there to reevaluate that as you go along if things change. The next thing is what may be done on the property. The way to think about this is if limitations aren't included, they don't exist, right? So you may want to say this lease is for um, grazing cattle only, right? If you don't say that, you may have them showing up with their kids in four-wheelers, or you may have all kinds of stuff happening. Limit what you want the limit to be. Are there any areas that are off limits to the tenant? Sometimes you'll lease the pasture but not the corrals, for example. The last thing I'll say, save yourself a tent situation in November. What's the first weekend in November, generally? Opening weekend of deer season. And everybody who's ever set foot on your property is going to have some cockamamie theory as to why they have the hunting rights. Okay? If you're going to lease your property, address in the lease who has the hunting rights. Does the tenant have them? Are you retaining them? Can the tenant lease them to someone else? How's that money split? Okay, spell that out. It's better to talk about that with a pencil in your hand than when there's guys standing across a fence holding firearms, right? Maintenance of fixed assets is important. Who's going to maintain things during the lease, like fences, wells, pumps, windmills, right? Those things come up. We're going to skip here a little bit to catch up. Um, hunting leases, all right? Super important, again, have your hunting leases in writing, okay? The first thing I'll say, my biggest concern on the hunting lease is liability, all right? My, th what I would advise people is if you're going to have people hunting on your property, you need to think about having three documents for every person. They need to sign a lease. They need to sign a general waiver of liability. 
And then you want to think about the Texas Agritourism Act release. And I'm going to talk to you about what that is in just a minute. So lease, liability waiver, Agritourism Act waiver. Now, why am I telling you everyone needs to sign a lease? I know we don't usually do this, right? Normally, one guy comes and signs a lease and then brings six guys with him. Here's the problem. If those six guys didn't sign a lease, I don't have a contract with them. And they're not bound by my terms that I've spelled out. So I want a lease from everybody. One thing to do there as far as guests, I like a term in a hunting lease that says, if you're going to bring people with you, you have to have written approval from the landowner. Okay? That means, number one, I know who's out there, because that may matter to me. Number two, I can make sure I chase down them signing all my waivers. All right? So that's something to think about as well. Um, I mentioned that. Okay. Uh, limitations on hunting methods. Sometimes this comes up. Can they use tree stands? Can they use deer blinds? Can they use corn feeders? If they can, when do they need to be out? When do they need to be off? Those sort of details. Can ATVs be used on the property? I'm not telling you yes or no. I will tell you that the number one insurance claim made in hunting accidents have to do with ATVs, so you better pay attention to that. The other thing I'll tell you is there's some plaintiff's lawyers in Texas using an interesting um, provision in the Texas Transportation Code that says um, people under the age of 16 cannot operate an SUV without um, adult supervision. And they're using that against landowners when something happens on the property and there were kids on four-wheelers. I might have a clause in my lease that says if you're going to bring kids under the age of 16 with four-wheelers, you have to have adult supervision. And if you don't, you'll indemnify me for any damages that happen. Because we've seen a couple of those cases pop up. Okay. Um, the next thing on a hunting lease, describe the lease property and limitations. I like a map. Right? So on the back of every hunting lease I do, I, I have print a map, highlight where you can hunt. You can also mark things on there like here's the house, here's the barn, right? Um, any dangerous conditions, this is a real good place to identify an abandoned well, for example. And that's important liability-wise. Where should the property be entered? You may want an in and out point that's specific. Uh, is anybody else going to have rights? It's a good idea to let, if you have multiple surface users, like a grazing tenant and a hunting tenant and an oil and gas operator, let them know about each other. What you don't want is one of them chasing the other guy off thinking he's doing you a favor and it's not helpful, okay? Another thing to do if you're leasing to somebody, and I, I listen, I don't do this when I'm leasing to my neighbor, okay? We're leasing to the guy from Austin who we don't know from Adam. He made a security deposit. And we said, look, if you don't tear anything up, if you don't leave trash everywhere, if you don't you know, tear up fences, et cetera, you're going to get your money back, just like you would on an apartment. Okay? A couple other real brief hunting terms that I think are important. Um, you may want to prohibit open flame. Okay? I think we all understand the reason for that. Um, another thing that you'll see sometimes is liquidated damages if they injure livestock. I like this. Okay? If some idiot shoots your cow thinking it was a deer, Okay? The idiot is going to think the cow's worth how much? $900 at the sale barn. Okay? You're going to think the cow's worth how much? $10,000 she won Denver. Okay? And we're going to fight about the value of the cow. One way to get rid of that is you say in there, if a cow or a bull or a whatever is injured or killed, you owe me X amount. You can agree to it in the lease. That's a contractual provision. It gets rid of all that bickering about the value of a cow. Okay? The last thing I'm going to say, and this has to do with liability, is you need to study up on your statutes related to landowner liability. There are two here and one more we're going to talk about that you need to be aware of. The first one's called the Texas Recreational Use Statute. This statute says that a landowner is liable only for intentional acts or gross negligence. That's a very high standard for a plaintiff to prove. This is good for a landowner. If three things happen, number one, if you have agricultural land, that's land that is suitable for growing crops or raising livestock. Suitable for. You don't have to be doing it. And I don't care what the appraisal district says. Okay? Suitable for. Number two, the plaintiff was there for a recreational purpose. There's a big list. Hunting, fishing, hiking, biking, riding four-wheelers. Okay? And then it says, and anything else associated with enjoying the outdoors. 
So that's pretty broad. Okay? And then you have to do one of the next three options, any one of these three, if you don't charge a fee. So if I let my neighbor hunt on my property for free, the statute applies and I am only liable for intentional acts or gross negligence. That's a big deal. Okay? The second option is if your fees that you made from recreational users last year, total fees from last year, are not more than 20 times your property taxes. The statute applies. Okay? The third option deals with insurance. If you carry at least 500,000 per person, a million per occurrence, or 100,000 in property damage, that level of coverage or higher, the statute applies. We don't care what you charge. Okay? The second statute, I'm going to have to go fast because she's standing up waving at me, is the Texas Agritourism Act. This statute says if you've got a plaintiff on ranch or on agricultural land for a recreational or educational purpose, you are not liable if you have hung up a sign or you get a sign release. You can buy those signs. Everybody sells them. Cattle raisers has them, Farm Bureau, sheep and goat raisers. It costs 20 bucks. Okay? You can either hang up a sign or get them to sign a release. That language is in the statute. You just print it off. Have them sign it, okay? The last statute I want to mention, we're going to go really fast, really fast. Okay, um, there's the Farm Animal Liability Act. I'm just going to tell you about a case because that's what matters, okay? The Farm Animal Liability Act says that landowners are not liable, not landowners, owners or anybody is not liable for injuries that occur from a farm animal activity, okay, if it, the injury was an inherent risk of the activity. Let me give you a case that explains it. Little boy goes over to his friend's house. Parents are all there, okay? Two families hanging out. They've got a bunch of horses tied up at the end of the day. Six-year-old kid crawls on a horse, the visiting child, and another child. They're going to ride down to the end of the road, turn around and come back. Fine, they ride to the end of the road, no problem. They turn around and come back, what happens? Barn sour horses, right? Six-year-old gets bucked off, gets injured, his family sues the ranch that owns the horses, okay? And the defense for the ranch that owns the horses, they said the Farm Animal Liability Act applies. It's an inherent risk that when you ride a horse, you could get bucked off. That's what this statute was designed for. Now, the parents of the child said, wait a minute, there's an exception in the statute. The exception says, if you provided an animal to the person and did not make a reasonable and prudent effort to determine the ability to safely engage in the activity and manage the animal, okay? If you didn't do that, you can still be liable, right? So what I'm telling you is, before you put somebody on a horse, before you put somebody on a, in a pen to work heifers, you better ask them, have you ridden a horse before? How many times have you been on a horse? You better think about what horse you're putting them on, etc. Okay? All right. We don't have time to go anymore. All right. A couple of additional resources. I mentioned that Rancher's Agricultural Leasing Handbook. You can get that on my website. I'm going to give you that in just a second. There's another website called Ag Lease 101. Uh, that website has some useful information as well. Um, and then we do a, a series of Rancher's Leasing Workshops. These are half-day programs around the state on leasing. It's sort of what I did here in a four-hour chunk of time where we could actually discuss some things uh, in more detail. Uh, we're going to have one in Perryton on May 22nd. Um, it's $50 a person or $80 a couple. We'll give you a copy of that handbook and we'll feed you lunch. Right? So if you're interested, contact me. I'm going to put my info up here in just a second. Here's my website um, that we talked about earlier. It's a blog where I post ag law info. If you just go to agrilife.org slash Texas Ag Law, or you can Google Texas Agriculture Law Blog. Every time I post, it, it's, uh, it's on ag stuff, any fact sheets I do or checklists, they all go here. There's a little box over here that will let you put your email address in. If you do that and click subscribe, it will come to you just like an email from me every week when I post. Okay? I also have a podcast. I know John O'Leary taught us about podcasts earlier. Um, I've got one. So if you're a podcast listener, um, we're on iTunes, we're on your podcast app, or you can listen on your computer. It's aglaw.libson.com. Just go there. Every episode I talk to an uh, ag lawyer about a different topic. We've done eminent domain, we've done water law, 
farm and ranch estate planning. They're free. You just got to go to that website, push play. Okay? The last slide has my contact info. There's my phone number and email. I'm on social media, blog, podcast. So this is the one you want to take your pictures of. Sorry, I should have told you that earlier. Um, if you guys have questions after today, if I can get you information, if you're interested in my other programs, let me know. I'm more than happy to help get you pointed in the right direction. Thank you very much.